It is Monday night in East Lansing. Jim Comproni, publisher SpartanMag.com. Welcoming everybody into Talk Michigan State Sports for the next hour, hour and change. Going to have a good time doing it. Appreciate everybody checking in with us again. Uh, interesting news week. Interesting news week. It's late August. Felt a little bit cool in the state of Michigan today. A little bit cool. A little bit cool. A little bit. I don't want to say chilly, but when he got in the in the uh, in the shadows. Um, what did Seeger say? It's like autumn closing in. You had autumn closing in around the state of Michigan today. No football, though. I don't I don't want to remind you of the bad news. Usually we're cranking toward football at this time of the year. Instead, maybe extend the summer a little bit, maybe get up north a little bit, do some bucket list things you don't normally do in the fall, but don't get too far away from college football. We're going to need you when it comes back, and it will be back someday. It might be going strong, who knows, in other parts of the country. Not sure how that's all going to turn out, but thanks for checking in with us again. Uh, if you're not familiar with SpartanMag.com, it is the church of what's happening now with Michigan State sports. That's what, and especially the Underground Bunker message board. The Underground Bunker provides the daily narrative on Michigan State sports. Go over there, and we talk Michigan State sports all the time, every day. And what we do here in this little program that we do maybe once a week, um, try to do it once a week. Been a little bit off the last couple of weeks intermittent a little bit but over at the underground bunker message board spartanmag.com subscribers post questions over at the, under, at the underground bunker message board and we entertain those questions mailbag style here on spartan mag live and uh i'm gonna have to plug something in, in a minute and also we invite you guys to ask some questions over in the chat area and those are always, uh, we always get interesting feedback and participation from the masses. And we've got some new things brewing. I've been saying that for several weeks, but I worked on it a little bit more this week. Wasn't quite ready to kick it off, but it will be coming soon. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll have uh, things to talk about. I need to talk about things because there's not going to be football. Not going to be football, obviously. And, you know, strange things going on in the Big Ten today. We might get into that a little bit with, uh, you know, Sandy Barber, the athletic director at Penn State, basically disclosing during a press conference that it was unclear to her whether or not there was ever a vote by Big Ten presidents. And the president of the University of Minnesota, Joan Gable, said, uh, quote, there was not a vote per se. There was a deliberative process, unquote, talking about the decision to pull the plug on the college football season this year. Now, why did Sandy Barber have a press conference this week? I mean, other athletic directors have been having press conferences also. But if you're a press conference, you know that question is coming and you know how you're going to answer it or you uh, rehearse how you're going to answer that. I don't think that was off the cuff. I think Sandy Barber wanted to put that out there, that there was not a vote. I think it was calculated. The question is why? What is she trying to do with her calculations? Um there's another quote in there. I didn't see the press conference, so I'm not exactly sure about the context of this, but she says something about, quote, doing everything that we can to find a way to have a season safely, unquote. She was talking about that in terms of what they were trying to do before the pseudo vote took place to try to find a way to have a season safely. Or is she saying that they're still trying to find a way to have a season safely? Now, I mean, can the, can the Big Ten backtrack on what they've done? I don't see how they can do it. I mean... What they did, they really stuck their chin out there saying, we're going to set the trend. We don't care what other people are doing. This is what we're doing. I respect that decision. A lot of you may as well. And they've taken some abuse for it, taken some criticism for it. You know, even Tom Izzo said a couple of days ago that he was kind of hoping that they would wait a little longer for more information to come in. Um, they've taken some criticism mainly because the decision came just a few days after they released the schedule. Really awkward. Even when they released the schedule, Big Ten Commissioner Warren uh, said that, you know, even when that was released, he said, hey, you know, I don't, I don't know. We, we may not play football anyway. And insiders were saying there's less than a 25% chance they'd play football. Then the presidents had their little straw vote, their little meeting, their deliberative process. And it was announced on, you know, six days ago that the, that the season 
was postponed five days, six days after the schedule was released. Okay, the schedule was released because that was athletic directors and their team of people putting it together. And then the, and the commissioner went along with it. And then a few days later, the presidents voted or had their deliberative process. They canceled the season. You guys know that. So if you're the commissioner, do you let the schedule go, go out knowing that the presidents are going to deliberate like this? What it comes down to is they should have had better communication. And we got the sense from Warren that they weren't going to have a football season, even the day that the schedule was re- released. He should have had the foresight to tell the schedule makers, hey, look, I appreciate all the work you did to put in, put that schedule together. It's a very elegant schedule, as Bill Beekman said, but we're not going to go forward with it right now because in talking with the presidents, this is coming down the pike. They're not going to okay the season if he had, in fact, spoken with the presidents, which I assume he would. That's a big part of his job. He didn't do it. The Big Ten's getting skewered for it. Um, in terms of the awkwardness of all of that. So here's the deal. Right now it's Monday. Wednesday, James Franklin is having his press conference. I assume he will push that rhetoric forward even more. But the question is, is did Sandy Barber of Penn State put that out there and then Franklin's going to come out? And the president of Penn State, I think, might have been on the side of waiting. You know, initially there was a lot of talk about the vote being 12 to two with only what Nebraska and Iowa disagreeing with the rest of them. Tim Brando had a tweet earlier today saying that the vote was actually eight to six. So somebody reached out to Tim Brando and said, Hey, the vote was actually 10 or eight, six. Brando's not just going to make that up. In other words, somebody wants that out there because they want to jostle the apple cart a little bit more. Sandy Barber, Penn state jostling the apple cart a little bit. Franklin's going to come out on Wednesday. He's going to jostle that and jostle the apple card. Justin Fields of the players, what, 400,000 votes or signatures on the petition, the Let Us Play petition. I don't know if that's going to do any good. But the Big Ten really being stretched apart a little bit, leadership-wise, and you're not seeing anonymity. You're not seeing anything unanimity. You, you, help, me, help, help me here, guys. You're not seeing anything that's unanimous. And some of it is anonymous um, in that direction. There's no way the Big Ten's going to backtrack on what they did, though. I don't think. But the day before they announced it, you sure had Harbaugh out there going against his president. He's the only one that went against his president. You had Day out there for Ohio State. You had Franklin out there. You had Scott Frost out there trying to make last-ditch lobbies to save the season. They were doing that because they thought there was a chance they could make a difference. Now, in the back end, do these people think they've got a chance to make a difference? Sandy Barber at Penn State and the like. I don't know, because the the presidents are, you know, you're not going to push presidents around. Like I said last week, I'm thankful that the presidents, whether I agree with them or not, I enjoy the fact that the presidents came forward and said, you know what, We, we run these universities. Michigan State, Purdue University, Northwestern University, Michigan State University, these schools are not pro sports franchises. These are schools. These are universities. These are academic institutions. Um, They're not the Buffalo Bills. You don't make decisions. The presidents make decisions. Whether you agree with them or not, I enjoy that part of it. But And I don't see them going back on it. Also, what's happening at Notre Dame and what's happening at North Carolina in terms of the student positive tests um, will strengthen the side of those presidents who wanted to pull the plug. Uh, but those other conferences, SEC, ACC, will they be more even in, more emboldened and steadfast in their plans to go forward with their season? I would imagine so. I think they'd like to stick it to the Big Ten, make the Big Ten look bad. That's what the SEC is, SEC is all about. And they do it well. They make a lot of money. They win championships. But really, uh, at the beginning of every day and the end of every day, they want to um, show up the Big Ten. That's what they do. The Big Ten doesn't isn't uh, overly um, worried about the reciprocal of that. Anyway, let's get to the questions. Enough about that. You guys are probably sick of hearing other people talk about it, but uh, it's just interesting that you think that all the twists and turns are done, and then that happens today, and you're you're we are left connecting the dots, wondering, well, what does that all mean? It means something. 
We don't know what yet, but Franklin will talk on Wednesday. Won't have an impact, but uh, the Big Ten not operating in lockstep right now. And if the SEC and the ACC plays and they don't have major problems, the Big Ten, from a football standpoint, yes, they will be behind. They're already behind. There's already a gap between Northern States football and the SEC. That gap will uh, increase and it's, I mean, it would show no signs of dissipating anytime unless there's some sort of coaching revolution that takes place. The type of coaching revolution which took place in the SEC when Nick Saban went down there. When Saban went down there, the SEC was a soft conference. It was Steve Spurrier, fun and gun stuff. That was what was winning the big, winning the SEC. Tennessee did some of that. Tennessee was physical with the counter gap stuff they did with Fulmer, but and you saw what happened when Tennessee played Nebraska in the bowl game in 97 when Nebraska won the national championship and the hole that Nebraska put in Florida. That was the SEC pre-Saban going to LSU in 2000. When he went to the SEC, that conference changed. He caused the conference to change in terms of physical toughness and then recruiting. And then his offspring has helped some of the other programs. He set up LSU and LSU has, made, has continued to go forward even though the people that are there now have no connections to Nick Saban. He rebuilt that thing and set it on the tracks going forward. Now Georgia is in that category and maybe Tennessee. Florida tried it with a Nick Saban guy. didn't work out. Now South Carolina is trying it, but Saban changed that conference. Question number one, Hayden V8 from Grand Rapids. He says, Jim, will college football ever be the same? The answer is no. Um, not sure what, how drastic the changes are going to be, but there will be changes. And you will get used to the changes, just like rule changes. When they changed to the 40-second shot clock, play clock, and the officials hustled to set the ball quickly, didn't have to wait for the whistle and the start of the 30-second clock. Play was sped up, and before long you had teams snapping the ball at 14 seconds, 13 seconds, 12 seconds. And now we see teams do that, and we're accustomed to it. That was a drastic change in the way the game is played, but we get used to it. I don't see changes in the way the game is played, but there'll be changes. There'll be changes maybe that you don't see, maybe less crowded press boxes. I mean, um, you know, once we as a society get over COVID-19, will we fully be over it? Will there be a vaccine? Will it, will it come and go with some people like the flu? So it won't totally be gone, but... Will we as fans wear masks to games five years from now? Will we even notice that that's a difference? Um, this is my big question, is whether the popularity of college football could suffer. I've talked about this in the past, that I was a huge NFL fan growing up. I was a college football fan. College, I was a fan of everything, right? But I loved the Lions, loved Billy Sims, rooted for him, died with him, suffered with him. And then all of a sudden I wasn't. You know, I can remember a lot about the, you know, Seasons in 78, 79, 80, 81. And then around 82, I, I remember going back and looking at this, and I posted about this on Underground Bunker Message Board the other day. I went back, actually went back a few months ago, and I said, when did I really stop being a big Lions fan? I still appreciate the Lions, and I root for them. I think Matthew, Matthew Stafford seems like a really good person. I root for him because he looks, seems like a decent guy. Um, but for the most part, I'm not much of a Lions fan. became a Lions fan more in the last few years because my – my son is kind of a Lions fan, so that got me into it a little bit more. But I went 25 years there without caring about the Lions. Um, and it's not that I jumped off the bandwagon because I'm usually a poor weather fan. I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a fair weather fan. I'm a poor weather fan. That's that's what I do. <clears throat> so I went back. I'm like, well, what happened with me and the Lions? And I went back and looked at it. And it was right there in like 1982 when there was that first NFL strike. Didn't have NFL in September and maybe a little bit in October. And I was in eighth or ninth grade. I walked away from it. I remained a college football fan, college basketball fan, baseball fan, all the rest of it. But really never cared about the Lions again and didn't realize it at the time. In 84, Billy Sims was injured, and that was the end of that era. I was a Steelers fan, too, growing up. They were my AFC team. Around that time, Bradshaw, Harris, Swan, those guys were... Uh, retiring also. So NFL, I mean, I really, I'm struggled to maintain interest in the NFL. Tried to, to see what was going on, but just really, really didn't care. And I look back at it and that was the breaking point for me. That was the asteroid hitting my NFL planet was that strike in 81. I stepped away from it, 
didn't miss it, and really, what, 40 years later, have never been the same. I'm worried how many college football fans will be forced to step away from it in the Midwest, maybe nationally this year, and how many of those people will never be the same. I will always love college football. I was watching a game last night on yesterday on the Big Ten Network. They were replaying Nebraska at Penn State 1982. Todd Blackledge, Kurt Warner against Turner Gill, Mike Rozier, Stein Cooler, those guys. And Nebraska was a force. Penn State, with somewhat of an upset at home, got a very favorable call on a pass, I think, to Garrity, like down to the three-yard line with 12 seconds left. So the, the winning touchdown... Scored with four seconds left was a little two-yard touchdown pass rather than being a 20-yard touchdown pass. I mean, just an atrocious call. Uh, Receiver was out of bounds, but there's no replay back then. Anyway, I remember where I was when I was watching that game. I was in Tennessee for some reason. Can't remember why. You know, I might have been, that was 82. I might have been down there for the World's Fair in Knoxville. I've got family down there, so we were down there a lot. Anyway, um... I remember watching that game in my Uncle Bill's house, watching it. And just, it was a cooler day in Nebraska, or in Penn State that day. And looking at the the stadium shots, the the fans, the cheerleaders, the overcast, you could tell it was a little bit chilly. And I was watching it here in the summer, and you could just feel the crispness of the autumn air. Um, The fall, the coolness of it. it. you could, I could smell the leaves. I could, I could just feel. I, I haven't been like that in a while. I could just feel the football. Hadn't, you know, it's August. It's creeping in big time. I'm like, oh man. And then I was like, gosh, I'm not gonna have that this year. Um, so me, seeing those things, I'm always gonna have that. And, I'm, and if you're watching this, you will too. I'm wondering and curious about that next concentric circle of college football fan. Maybe the young ones coming up. Do they walk away from it and never go back the way I did in '82? I don't know. I don't know if you guys would agree with that or not. But um, there's going to be changes. I mean, uh, Notre Dame and the ACC will they get a taste of that and want to do more of that? I doubt it. Big Ten getting pulled apart of the seams a little bit. Nebraska fans not happy with the Big Ten right now. I'm sure you know, but they know money talks. They want to stay in the Big Ten. Everybody knows that. But I tell you what. And I'm not making any kind of political statement. Um, but if you're a Nebraska fan, and that's all that they have. I mean, college football is so big in Nebraska. And I've got a lot of respect for that. Nice people there. I enjoy going there. But if you are a Nebraska fan, there's no NFL. There's no NBA. There's no Major League Baseball. There's Nebraska football, period. And it's been that way for generations and decades. That is what they live for. There's seven home games. And they're great fans. That is their thing. You take that away from them. Frost wanted to play. The president wanted to play. Everybody in the state wants to play. You're taking away their one sport that they live for. And I think I saw the stat today. I don't want to say only. I don't want to diminish it. But in the state of Nebraska, I think there's only been 361 deaths from COVID since March. I don't want to say only. That sounds insensitive. But if you are a fan of Nebraska... And it's not really had an impact on your state yet. Of course, you can look around your country, the United States of America, and see what's happened, of course, in the past. New Jersey, New York, Michigan, Illinois, and currently California, Texas, Florida. It's a problem. I'm not saying it's not a problem. But for those people in Nebraska, you can see why they are frustrated because they don't think it's touched them. Now, of course, they have to play teams. I mean, if they're playing Penn State, Rutgers, Michigan State, it's touched those places. So they can go out and have an inter-squad game. It's like the old Steinbrenner thing with the Yankees. He used to talk about, well, I don't need the rest of the league. Actually, George needed the rest of the league because the Yankees can't just play intra-squad games and sell out the stadium. So, Nebraska, I mean, is there a chance the Big Ten could get jostled loose here in some fashion? I mean, we're kind of seeing some factions line up against one another. Um, if That just shows me you know, some of the comments from the Penn State athletic director that some of those presidents and athletic directors don't want – this stain on their shirt. If the Big Ten obviously doesn't play football and the other conferences do, the Big Ten's going to look bad. And those people are, there's a few people in the Big Ten that are going to be like, wasn't me. I voted the other way. You can see that right now. So they think there's potential for, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a potentially a PR nightmare right now 
it might prove that the Big Ten did the smart thing. I'm not saying that's not a possibility, but if the if if good news happens and they're able to play football down south, now the Big Ten people are going to look at each other and point like whose fault was this? And there's people already lining up saying, "Wasn't me. I didn't do it. I'm Penn State. I'm Nebraska. Whatever. I don't know." So the Big Ten's getting pulled pulled apart here a little bit. It's been the strongest conference for a long, long time. I don't see membership changing, but you're asking if, if football will change. I tell you where it's going to change. You know, I was talking about like my situation walking away from the NFL during that strike, and that was just a month or two, a month and a half. Um, the Pac-12. I mean, college football is. I don't want to say dying on the West Coast, but it's sick on the West Coast. USC's not been good. UCLA's not good. And when they're not good, no, the rest of the coast doesn't care as much. Per, you know, I mean, Oregon is good. They've got good fans. Washington trying to get going again. But you've seen what happens when they've they've tried to play their Pac-12 championship game. No one shows up. Um, UCLA versus USC, like what, 59,000 people in the, the Rose Bowl or the LA Coliseum for that game. I mean, Arizona State is going through a rebirth right now in football, but if it's not big in L.A., the rest of the league, it's just, it just it coughs and sputters. And you know the Pac-12, they've not been a factor in the college football playoff of late. They're not going to be a factor anytime soon, although Oregon was close to making it last year. You take the your average Joe Pac-12 college football fan who already didn't care as much, now you do this, I mean, that Pac-12, you know, and, it, and this, it's symptomatic in a lot of ways. You know, last year, I think the stat was of the top 25 recruits in the state of California, 24 of them left the state of California to play college football, something like that. Like one of the top 30 stayed at home to play college football. The rest left. SEC is recruiting now in California more. California recruiting is still good. It's not as great as it used to be. It's still good. But participation levels are down in California for football. Um, You know, so this, so now, I mean, people are talking about the the American Conference potentially putting a play, uh, putting a team in the playoff this year. Big Ten and Pac-12 are out. So now, who are, you know, if someone goes 12 and 0 in the American, like Cincinnati or Central Florida or Memphis in recent years has been good, they're in the playoff. I mean, is it conceivable that? A year from now, a school like Central Florida could go into the Los Angeles area and recruit Central Florida, recruit against UCLA, and beat UCLA for an in-state kid, for a California kid. Is that possible? Would have been unthinkable five years ago, impossible ten years ago. How does college football change because of this? Something like that. All right. Now, this is how it can change also. And this could pertain directly to Michigan State. Uh, Michigan State right now, as near as I can tell, has 12 seniors. If you don't play this year and you don't play in the spring, do you bring those 12 seniors back next year? Does the NCAA allow that the way they did with college baseball? Would they allow that for the schools that don't play? What about the schools that do play? I would imagine if the rest of the country plays, the rest of the country, the SEC, ACC, if they have a season and the Big Ten decides not to, the NCAA is in the middle, what the hell do they do? I would imagine they would tell the Big Ten, hey, you didn't play, that was your choice, your players lose their year of eligibility. I've got to believe that's the way it's going to be. Now, the true seniors can take it as a red shirt. You know, guys like Jacob Panashuk, Jordan Reed. But players that have already used their red shirt, like A.J.R. Curry, Naquan Jones, um, did Dominic Dominic Long played right away? A lot of those guys played right away. But people like Luke Campbell, I think Matt Allen redshirted Art Curry. Those guys, do they get an extra year of eligibility? I wouldn't think so. If you give all those guys a year of eligibility, then you bring in your recruiting class. Michigan State with eighty five plus those twelve. Are they operating with ninety seven scholarship players next fall? Meanwhile, the Miami Hurricanes play a season this year. Their seniors lose their eligibility. They come back next year with 85. Would the NCAA allow a team with 97 to play against a team with 85? I don't think so. So that decision has to be 
figured out. I've got to send out a uh, tweet here in a second. Um, want to remind everybody to subscribe. Want to remind everybody to check out. Uh, to give us a thumbs up. Check out. Is it the Spartan Mag? I should know that, Justin. I'm sorry. Justin's really doing a great job handling the Spartan Mag Twitter feed for us. Go over there and become a subscriber at the Spartan Mag. Follow us on Twitter over there. Um, and as always, if you're not a subscriber to SpartanMag.com, we would like to invite you to become a subscriber at SpartanMag.com. We have a lot of fun over there covering Michigan State year-round, including when there's not going to be a, a fall football season because we, there is recruiting, and we're, re we're covering the heck out of recruiting. That's for sure. All right, that tweet just went out. Appreciate everybody listening and waiting. Let me check some questions here in the in the chat area. MM Drippy from Traverse City says, "Tell us about Justin Martin's game if you watch some film." Oh, whoop! I I, I jumped ahead there a little bit. Um. MM Drippy's first, and he's back. Drippy's very excited about being the first one here. Brad Fashenko, Brad from Austin, is here. He's keeping Austin weird. We appreciate that. Rob South says, what's up, fellas? Old Tuck, the usual suspects, right on time. Appreciate you guys. Old Tuck is the bell cow. M.M. Drippy, he's the bell cow of the group. M.M. Drippy says, just closed on a new house today. I'm pumped. Up in Traverse City? Is that right? Sounds great. I'm jealous, man. I love Traverse City. I love Traverse City. Got any questions here? Just close the new house. Mr. Bone Man says, about time, comp. You've been missed. Thanks, Bone Man. M.M. Drippy says, sipping on a blue Kool-Aid tonight because the Lions started camp today. Drink some blue Kool-Aid. That's good for you. Appreciate that. They started camp today. The Honolulu Blue. How about it? Okay. Um, feel free, everybody, to on a Monday night here at 930 Eastern Time to uh, drink as much as you want. And since you're home, you're not going to need a designated driver. But if you're using stairs... Um, let people know you're using the stairs ahead of time so they know where they can find you if there's a problem. Rob South, the big toe of the operation. Mr. Bowman looks like Izzo has a Fab Five. Well, that depends on if the two guys re, uh, reclassify. M.M. Drippy says, who's the next football commitment? Is, uh, is Corey here right now? Corey's got a great feel for these things. You know, I didn't really see the, uh, you know, Alex Okello commitment coming. We did in the final 72 hours leading up to his decision, but that one kind of came out of nowhere a little bit. We're trying to find out how the New Jersey guys liked their visit. I don't know if they're in, in any hurry to do it, but Gino Vandemark, Audric Estime, the running back, the offensive lineman, a couple of four stars. We're trying to find more information on what they thought about their visit. I, I assume if there were to be any movement, it might be somebody who recently visited such as that. Kenneth Roberts says, go get them, Tigers. $1.99 in the sponsorship tip jar. Appreciate that. Thank you. Really appreciate your support here. Um, but if someone's going to commit, it's usually something like that that jostles it, a visit. I didn't see any indications that they were planning to make a decision prior to their visit. But it'd be easier to choose one of them. I'm not predicting it, but it'd be it'd make more sense to choose one of them than someone out of left field. Although, uh, you know, the kid from Nashville, the defensive end, he kind of came out of left field a little bit. And, and it seems like Michigan State is hitting the gas pedal a little bit more. They had the two months without a commitment. They've been pushing a little bit more here lately to get some momentum going again. I mean, they've been recruiting hard throughout, but then it seems like you take it to another level to uh, to really go after somebody like Ruquan Buckley. It seems like the heat might be be turned up on him a little bit more, even though Buckley, the lineman from Wyoming, Michigan, Godwin Heights High School, he's not planning to make a decision until October, but it seems like Michigan State might be turning up the wick a little bit on him. All right, let's go back to the mailbag. Um... 
MSU Polo from Rockford, Michigan says, what strikes you as the most in, uh, as being the most interesting thing about Tucker's personality in contrast to Mark D'Antonio? I know you've only had a few opportunities to talk to him, but I'm curious to know what you see as what's different with Tucker and his way of doing things. Well, I, a lot of you can see right away that um, Tucker is a lot more gregarious, outgoing, especially with social media. I mean, D'Antonio's from a generation like like Izzo and, and others that are kind of standoffish and they don't trust social media, don't really know what how to do with what to do with it. Tucker sees it, wants to utilize it. And I said that from day one when he was hired. I heard that from insiders that he wanted to really put a new coat of paint on Michigan State's social media image and branding. He saw them do it at Georgia with success. And he saw them do it here at Michigan State in quick order. So that's the that's the big one. And you, you guys can all see that. Um, he's a lot easier with a smile. He's a lot more loose so far talking with media. Now he's not lost any games yet. And he's not had the fire put under his feet um, by the media. It happens to all coaches. But a lot of times... Michigan State fo- coaches feel like there can be a double standard for Michigan State coaches compared to other coaches around the state. He's not experienced that yet. But right now, I mean, he's feeling life is good. He's happy to do his job. He wants to get started. And it's just a light, cheerful effervescence about him. That's different. Now, Mark D'Antonio had a great personality. I got along with him great. I have great respect for him. He did a great job of the program. Going to be really hard to match what he did. Very, very hard to match what he did. Um... I'm just saying in terms of, I don't want to say the entertainment value. I don't know if Tucker's doing it for an entertainment reason, just his natural personality. He's more of a salesperson. And if if he starts to win a little bit, I'll be really eager and interested to see w- what that could mean on the recruiting trail once he's able to get his boat in the water and actually go out and recruit face-to-face, have people come in face-to-face. If he's got some wins to advertise, be interested to see how that goes. As far as recruiting goes, you know, D'Antonio became quite reliant on his Ohio ties, and that served him well over the years. Last year, the recruiting class was Michigan State's recruiting poll was not great, especially in the state of Michigan. Oh, and Michigan State circled back and relied on their Ohio contacts, put together, I think, a pretty solid class, uh, with largely with Ohio kids. What they signed? Eight or nine Ohio guys last year? This year, so far, Michigan State with one Ohio commitment. Mel Tucker is an Ohio guy, a Cleveland guy, and he will recruit in Ohio at some point, and he'll do it pretty well, but he is less reliant on that safety net right now. As coaches get going and put in three years, four years, five years, six years, they get their recruiting safety nets. They get their their way of doing things, and and I'm sure he'll be no different. He'll have his areas that that he hits upon with frequency, and... I just think it's gonna it'll be a little bit more widespread than what D'Antonio did. D'Antonio had a great success the only way he did it. D'Antonio dipped into Georgia more than his predecessors. A little bit in Texas, not great success return wise from Texas. I mean, Josh Butler bounced around a little bit, Tyler Higby a little bit. Um going back several years, Nick Foles, of course, for a short period of time. D'Antonio a little bit in Florida, but not much. Recruiting in Florida can be a little bit dicey. So Tucker is busy in Texas, remains busy in Georgia, more busy in Florida than D'Antonio was, more busy in California, so it's more widespread. Offensive philosophy, I don't think there's going to be much difference between D'Antonio and Tucker. I don't know if that's going to shock anybody or scare anybody, but they want to block, they want to dominate the inside, they want to be able to run when they need to run. Um, They're both blocking and tackling details, guys. Let's go to question number three from Michigan State University, who says, those of you that are subscribers to SpartanMag.com, you know Michigan State University. That's what it goes by. He's a a great um, contributor to the Underground Bunker Message Board. Very knowledgeable, very tied in. Has great sources in a lot of ways. And he says he's back from the dead via Ann Arbor, Michigan, via Walled Lake, via Flint, Michigan. Back from the dead. He had a bout with covid that led to some other problems. And he talked about it on our message board. Led to open heart surgery. And quite frankly, he had to fight off the ropes. Seriously, was on a ventilator for a while. And uh, 
He's one of our best posters. Um, and we're all glad he pulled through, man. And I hope he doesn't mind me saying, but it sounds like his rehab is finishing today, and I think he's going home tomorrow. We're very happy about that. I'm glad that he's contributing a question here tonight. Glad that he's with us. And uh, look forward to um, getting to know him better. Good guy. He says, Comp, in your opinion, what will MSU ath- athletics look like post-2020? So that's another one of these sports business crystal ball forecast type of situations. He says, uh, he says, uh, in your opinion, what will athletics look like? He says, from what I hear, our athletic department will most likely lose 60 to $100 million plus due to canceling football this year. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think our fan base realizes that no one wanted college football to be played this fall more than our administration due to those very real financial concerns? You know, those losses, you're talking 60 to $100 million. That's congruent with what I think Gary Barda, the athletic director at Iowa, sent an email to fans or donors or something, and he estimates the losses are going to be nine figures getting into that $100 million range that you're talking about. $100 million. It's hard to keep the lights on when you're expecting $100 million, and then you wake up one year and you don't have those $100 million. Wow. Multiply that times 14 Big Ten teams, you're over a billion dollars in losses. And they were willing to walk away from it. I respect that. It hurts my business, but that's not that's not that important. Um, important to me, but there's more important things, obviously. You know, you look at Michigan State's budget. I think uh, they had a budget of $132 million last year, the athletic department. Wisconsin, I, th- I saw it reported like $157 million. I think they get more from concessions. Penn State grossed. One hundred sixty-four million. So that gives you an idea of what Big Ten teams usually gross, what they generate, not what they make. That's what they generate. By the way, I was looking at Michigan State's budget. And I think there was something on there about parking. They might be getting money from parking now. I might be outdated when I say that the athletic department does not get money from parking and concessions. Nothing in there from concessions. I still think they don't get concessions. But parking, um, there were some notes in there. You know. Three, four million dollars if I was reading it right, getting getting it from parking. Well, that money's gone. Two million for sports camps. That never happened. It just adds up, adds up, adds up. Not just the TV money that you lose. So you're asking what will athletics look like without that hundred million dollars? In order to keep the lights on, I mean, I'll, you've got that money and you've got a rainy day fund, but a hundred million dollars worth to keep the lights on, to keep people paid, to keep people on the payroll. There's some talk about big about Pac-12 schools borrowing money, the Pac-12 borrowing and schools could pick from it whatever they needed. I've not heard that about the Big Ten, but that's got to be something that they would look into if the Pac-12 does that. But, um, you know, people talk about cutting sports, but if you cut a sport, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to make a huge difference if you're talking about losing $100 million. Um. I was looking at the budget, and the budget for, for MSU baseball is $1.1 million. Softball, $1.1 million. Golf, $400,000. Swimming, men's, $750,000. Women's swimming, $970,000. Wrestling, $850,000. Budget, rowing, crew, women's crew, $1.9 million. That's because they've got a lot of people on scholarship on the crew team. And... Um, those scholarships are a big part of that budget. So if you cut a sport, a lot of times when you cut a sport, you don't send your athletes out on the street. You don't just cut them loose. When you cut a sport, usually those players can remain on scholarship. When they cut, you know, they cut Michigan State cut lacrosse and fencing and men's gymnastics over the course of a few years back in the mid-90s. And those players, I'm pretty sure those athletes stayed on campus, whatever scholarship they had, they retained. A lot of those were partial scholarships. These are different times, though. Maybe you cut them and you, you cut the sport and sorry, you're not on scholarship anymore. I don't know. My point is, you can cut men's and women's swimming 
it'll save you, you know, $1.7 million. Um, if you're going to lose $100 million, you cut two sports, you've saved, you know, one point seven. I mean, all of the salaries and benefit packages across the board with support staff members, you know, I'd be worried about some of the support people at a lot of these sports. I don't know. Maybe a combination of really tightening the belt in a lot of those areas behind the scenes that you and I don't see a whole lot. And maybe that maybe they set up a system where they are borrowing like a Pac-12. You're asking me, what does Michigan State athletics look like? Beekman last week said, never say never in terms of making drastic decisions like that. I think... Uh, the NCAA, you have to have 14 sports minimum to be NCAA Division One. I. I could see the NCAA waiving that for a while, and maybe that'll never be the same. Big Ten, I think, requests that you have anywhere from 15 to 18 sports at least. I could see them loosening that up a little bit, or their demands, their uh, expectations for how many sports you carry. But like I say, when you're carrying sports, if you cut sports, you're not going to save a whole lot of money, believe it or not. I don't know. A lot of you, a lot of the work that you people do, some of you would probably know have a better idea of what to do to cut those budgets and trim it better uh, than I do. Anyway, question number four from Mile High in Golden, Colorado. He says, hey, hey Jim, I hope your family and friends are healthy and safe. Thanks. Same to you out in Golden, Colorado. Thank you for... All you and the Spartan Mag staff do. I echo that. Spartan Mag staff is outstanding. Corey Robinson, Justin Thin doing a great job. Paul Konadek, as always. We haven't seen Ricardo Cooney in a while. I haven't seen him since the shutdown, the quarantine. But he's staying warm in the bullpen. We'll bring him back one of these days. Rico Beard, congratulations to you, my friend. I don't know if I've had one of these since you got the call up, the big rig, the big keys with my other friend, Mike Valeni. On 97 won the ticket. The best tag team since Piper and Orndorff. Beard and Valeni. My guys. Stay calm. They won't. That's fine. That's good. Anyway, Rico Beard, he posts still once once in a while. I asked him now that he's the big wig if um if his if it's gonna cost more to get him on Spartan Mag live or to get, to get him on uh, the post-game V-casts now. He didn't say no, so we'll have to see about that. But once we have games again, I'm sure he'll have opinions. Love to have Rico on there telling us what he thinks and, of course, promoting uh, the tag team with Valeni, that show. All right, Mile High says, um, what is the outlook for Michigan State's defensive front seven for recruiting in 2021? Any feel for the number of players we take at each defensive line and linebacker position? You know, Tucker's t- been talking about, he's mentioned before that he expects to have 25 guys in this class. I don't know how they're going to arrive at 25. I would have anticipated that he was expecting some attrition. He'd have to have attrition to make room for 25. The attrition most notably would have come from spring practice and August camp. And he's had neither, so he's had a, he has not had a chance to evaluate his roster and suggest to some players when it's time to go. Just checking the microphone there. So he's not been able to do that. And, um, But I think they're still talking 25. They've got, what, 10 or 11 commitments right now. You know, they've got a couple defense. you know, the defensive end from Nashville, Alex Okello, 6'6", 220, Tyson Watson from a few months back from Warren Mott. He's a defensive end in a 3-4, plays defensive end like a 5 technique. Probably going to end up growing into becoming a 3-tech. We've compared him to Joel Heath type of guy, so I think that's a defensive tackle. Derek Harmon from Detroit Loyola, a big body. I think an underrated guy. I think he's well coached. I think he's got some components. He's got some work to do. But I think Harmon and Watson give you two defensive tackles. Okello's an edge guy. They'll need another defensive end, I would think. If you're going to sign 25, that would mean five, four defensive linemen. Uh, you know, they still re- they're recruiting the guy, Ruquan Buckley. I talked about him earlier from Godwin Heights. Offensive lineman, defensive lineman. Um, 6'5", 250. He's looking at Michigan State, Florida State, Minnesota, Nebraska. 
Chris Kapilovic doing a real good job recruiting him for Michigan State. Michigan State is recruiting him with the choice that he can that it could go offensive line or defensive line. He has visited Michigan State and he visited Nebraska in February. He wanted to make more visits in the spring and summer. Didn't happen. Talking about Ruquan Buckley. I think he's ranked number 15 in the state by Rivals.com. So Minnesota wants Buckley as an offensive lineman. Nebraska wants him as a defensive lineman. When I look at him, I see in Buckley some good core strength. Good core strength. After engagement on offense or defense, he runs his feet well, which is an indication of just good core strength and horsepower moving forward to get bring that leg through contact. It's good to have that. It could help you as a defensive tackle. It could help you as an offensive lineman a lot, obviously. When you look at his junior film, you don't get a real good look at his lateral movement as an offensive lineman. He's not really tested that way on his film. So maybe Minnesota has seen enough to think he's an offensive tackle. Um, I've not seen, all I've seen is his highlights. You'd have to look at like every snap of every game. He's not going against the greatest competition on his film. So that's something you have to take into consideration. Also, with Buckley, it's also hard for me to get a read on his initial quickness on offense or defense on his film. It would have been nice to see him in camp to get a better look at that against, you know, other excellent athletes in a shorts and t-shirt type of setting. On defense, you don't get to see him pass rush and turn the corner. He's playing a lot of three technique. He's not really doing much edge rushing that we see. The closing speed looks pretty good. So I think he could be a defensive lineman, that core strength and the closing speed. Not a guy that's going to turn the corner, but if he's a three technique defensive tackle, that's that's a bonus if you get that out of him. So Buckley, I think, could be in that in that offensive line, defensive line, either or. You're asking about defensive front seven. I'm guessing if you looked at the Michigan State War Room board, that number would that name would be there, maybe in parentheses, as a possible defensive uh, guy from Michigan State. And I think State's got a solid chance to to get him, but they've got more work to do. Nebraska's been recruiting him really well. You know, no linebacker commitments yet. And last year, Michigan State signed three linebackers. You know, Josiah Robinson from Groveport, Ohio, uh, Devin Hightower from Akron, and Cal Halliday from Catawissa, Pennsylvania. Those guys were kind of solid. None of them really blew me away. Uh, but those are three linebackers last year. No commitment so far this year. You've been hearing in recent days about Michigan State becoming uh, more um, more involved with the kid from Las Vegas, Bishop Gorman, who's committed to USC, Ma'a Goatioti. Probably not pronouncing that right, but much respect to him. 6'2", 220, committed to USC, ranked the number 93 player in the country, four-star recruit. Indications are it's Michigan State and Colorado right now. He's committed to USC, but a lot of indications out of USC are that he will not end up a Trojan. Michigan State's been working to try to flip him for several weeks. Now it's looking like that's probably going to happen. He's not visited Michigan State yet, so that recruitment is stalled until stalled until he does. I look at Goatioti's film. And he's listed at 6'2", 220. He looks heavier than 220. Reminds me of a Greg Jones type of guy. Good tackler. Um, pretty good linebacker. Top 100? I don't know. But that's a linebacker that Michigan State is... Uh, I, I got to watch more film before I, before I know. But it reminds me of Greg Jones a little bit right now. And Jones became an All-American. Was very good as a junior. Good as a senior after he added some weight. Maybe the weight wasn't his best best uh, decision going into his senior year. Mikai Gabayor out of Ir- Irvington, New Jersey, 6'2", 220, number 20 in the state of New Jersey. Michigan State turning up the heat on these guys a little bit more since they lost out on, on Budden, the linebacker from Belleville. It seems like, it seems like turning up the wick on these guys a little bit more. Gabayor was um, planning to visit Michigan State last week. Didn't happen. He's going to visit sometime soon is the word. You know, West Virginia, Kentucky, Nebraska in on him. Looking at his film, reminds me a little bit of like a Seth Mitchell, Caleb Thornhill type of guy. Inside linebacker type of guy. I think Guatioti is an inside linebacker type of guy. I don't think he's a uh, you know, hybrid slot type of player. Uh, you know, those are some players Michigan State's looking at in that front seven. Other names will be coming on. I asked uh, Corey about that. Corey's got his ear to the ground real good on that and – We'll probably post something here in the comments section after we're done um, if there's other names. And, of course, the Underground Bunker message board, there will be uh, constant surveillance of 
Michigan State defensive front seven. But D-line is close to being done, I would think. Linebacker haven't started yet, and they're going to have to get busy there. Question number five, M.M. Drippy from Traverse City is questioning about Alex Okello, the commitment from Nashville. He says Okello is listed at 217 pounds right now. With his ability to move and his frame, where do you think he needs to get to to be at his best? With his frame, I think he can add a lot of weight and not lose any of that speed. His frame reminds me a little bit of Demetrius Cooper. Cooper ended up being a you know pretty good player at Michigan State. Nothing great, never quite reached that potential. Had a little bit of off-the-field problems late in his career. Cooper came in and committed to Michigan State at about 6'6", 205, 210. Ended up being 6'6", 250 by the time he was a senior. That didn't affect his speed. I think Okello, with his athleticism and his frame, I think he could comfortably weigh 250 and still be able to move real well. Now, Okello... I, I've, I posted some things about what I thought about his game over at the Underground Bunker Message Board a couple of days ago. Impressed with quite a few things that he does. He's still new to football. Good takeoff, good initial speed, good hip flexibility, turn to the corner, ankle flex, hip flex. He's got that. Uh, the starting of good flexibility there, and it'll just get better. Um, I think that Okello is a little bit faster than Cooper was. I went back today and watched Demetrius Cooper's high school film. And if I remember right, Cooper's senior year in high school was bumpy for some reason. Was there like a strike in Chicago or something? And he missed a lot of games, if I'm remembering right. But anyway, Cooper's high school film, you know, good straight line speed. And Cooper got his commit, got his offer from Michigan State at Michigan State's camp. Came in, not really as an unknown but really forced the hand of Michigan State to get a scholarship offer while he was at camp. Showed some pass rush ability, lean guy, frame, athleticism, high ceiling. Never quite reached that ceiling. And the ceiling was good, but it wasn't great because he didn't really have that hip flexibility. Not as stiff as the kid from Battle Creek who was who had more speed but less turned the corner flexibility. Cooper, going back and watching his high school film today, in high school, you know, he was kind of stiff. He was more stiff than Okello is. Um, Cooper, decent straight line speed. He played a stand-up defensive end, a stand-up outside linebacker in a 3-4, was a linebacker. Turn of the corner, he would kind of come apart a little bit, would get a little bit awkward and stiff. And if he was pursuing a quarterback in the backfield, he was not real fluid in his ability to to make a sharp hairpin turn to get to the, to get to the ball. A lot of times he would... He would come apart a little bit. Cooper was a good college player, but this kid, Okello, I think is a little bit faster, and he's got more flexibility. So Okello puts on that weight and gets a 250. I think it could serve him even better than it did with with Cooper. Uh, Drippy says, and I look forward to I hope, I hope I hope Okello can get on the field this year in Tennessee because he's only played one year of football, and it wasn't even a full year, so... I'm going by junior film. There's some video of his workouts here recently, and with some of the hip flip work that he does, uh, I'll be curious to see how much better he'll get from year one to year two. Excellent basketball player in the past, hence the the um, comparisons to Shalit Calhoun, who was a basketball first guy for a long time also. Drippy also asks question number B. Coach Mark D'Antonio said that the players are really excited to hit the weight room. I'm sorry. Coach Mel Tucker said the players are really excited to hit the weight room and love the strength and conditioning program they have. He says, are the players pleased with the equipment or coaching or both? It's not the equipment. The equipment are the same. It's the coaching. And I love Ken Manny, Hall of Famer. They're going to name buildings after him at Michigan State, or they should. But I've said it before in another podcast. Ken Manny... Of the last couple of years, not quite the same as mid-90s Ken Manny, when Ken Manny was just a ball of fire getting things done. He was still getting things done later in his career, but none of us are going to be as good late in our career at anything compared to our best days. Novak comes in, working well with Manny during the transition. And I, I no disrespect to Manny. I've got great respect for him. He made a great contribution to the athletic department of Michigan State. And what he did through all those coaching changes, wonderful wonderful, um, positive to Michigan State football and athletics. Um, no disrespect to him at all. With Novak, when a new coach comes in, 
I mean, the energy, the the enthusiasm about getting the gears going and hitting the ground running with your program. There's nothing like that. When you get a guy that's qualified with a good resume like Novak, you turn over the keys of the big rig to him, let him do it. These players see it. There's a different level, different level of, you know, just tempo and enthusiasm and all of it. And, you know, Manny had all those things too. And there's a, plenty of former players that would go to war for him, no question. But these new players, after being around Manny for a little bit at the end and a new guy coming in, they really like the work that's going on with the new guy. For the fifth time, nothing against Manny, but Novak came in wanting to hit the ground at a thousand miles an hour, and they're excited about it. But you're right. Um, let's see. Let's see. Are the players pleased? You're saying you're asking, are the players pleased? For a minute there, I needed to read read it to see if you were saying that you had heard that the players are pleased. Well, I've heard that the players are pleased, and um, that's going to be a good thing. And right now, they're in the strength and conditioning restart right now. Question number six, Kelly Spartan says, born and bred in Inkster. And I'm going to get back to that six-and-a-half-week concept that Tucker talked about in the Zoom press conference a couple of days ago. That Zoom press conference, you can see it here on the YouTube channel. Uh, Tucker, six-and-a-half weeks right now, strength program hitting full tilt. I've got some more thoughts about that here later in the edition of Spartan Mag Live. Question number six from Callie Spartan, who says, born and bred in Inkster, buttered in the east side of Detroit. I like that. Born and bred in Inkster, buttered in the east side of Detroit. Cool. He says, could we see a fall televised green and white game? All right, now I'm going to get into the six and a half week thing. With people clamoring for football, if we have not, if we have no negative tests, they could at least let us watch a practice or a scrimmage just to get through this football less time. Um, they're not going to care about the fans a whole lot. I mean, the fans pay the freight with those tickets, but this fall, I mean, it's all going to be about, about safety. But I hear what you're saying. If there's big gains in that area, could we see a green-white game with fans? Uh, probably not. Could we see a green-white game of some sort? Okay, this, one, this is where I'm going to go with this. Tucker said a few days ago, on the Zoom broadcast, and we wrote about it, SpartanMag.com, and I thought this was an important takeaway. He said that they are they had just started a six-and-a-half-week period of strength and conditioning, setting the culture of the program, improving the strength of the, of the players. All well and good. Doing that rather than getting on the field with footballs and helmets. Padded practice not allowed by the Big Ten right now. But it's my understanding you can get on the field and run routes and do X's and O's. But right now, Mel Tucker not worried as much about the X's and O's. He's worried about the Jimmys and Joes, as they say. He wants to get the guys in shape because he didn't get to work with them all spring and summer. They missed all that conditioning. They want to make up for lost time. Makes sense to me. Yeah, you could lift weights and get on the field, but you couldn't lift weights as much and as hard as you can if you put all your energy into strength and conditioning right now. Very interesting concept and phrase that Tucker said. He said he wants to use it. He's considering it like January right now. He's considering it January strength and conditioning, winter conditioning. Makes kind of sense what he did. You know, they're talking about spring football, possibly theoretically, beginning football games in the spring. So when would that be? Maybe March 1st, theoretically. So March 1st is your new September 1st. So now August is your new January. Makes sense. So six and a half weeks, I asked Mel Tucker, after the six and a half weeks, then what do you do? And he said, we're going to have to wait and see what the rules are. Um, my guess is he's going to want to put the pads on at that time. My guess is if you're considering this January, if January is now, and if the season starts March 1st, or March 1st is like a September 1st, you go six and a half weeks. After six and a half weeks, the current six and a half week 
conditioning program will end around September 25th. My guess is, if you're using the usual football calendar, college football calendar, after September 25th, he'll want to take two weeks off, and from October 7th to November 15th, this is just my guess, he will want spring football during those five weeks, October 7th to November 15th. If I go back and do the math and subtract backward from March 1st, if you're thinking season starts March 1st. I know a lot of people think there's no way they're going to play a spring football season. Maybe that's true. But right now, as a football coach, you are operating with the assumption that that's what you're hearing and that's what you have to get ready for. So I'm thinking there's going to be a spring that the Big Ten coaches are going to say, hey, if we're playing in the spring, we need to have a time during the offseason to put some pads on. And it would make sense to me, October 7th to November 15th, you end the new spring practice, this year's pseudo-spring practice, November 15th. Do you end with a scrimmage? I think there's a real good chance that could happen. I think that that uh, that's the way that Tucker would probably have it mapped out right now in pencil. If he's allowed to do a normal off-season program, you go strength conditioning six and a half weeks, put on the pads, finish with the scrimmage, have a couple scrimmages in there. So if you have a... If you, if you have a, a green-white game November 15th in the stadium, are people allowed to go? Maybe parents of players? Be cold. Um, you're asking about television. It depends on if the SEC and the ACC are still playing. If they are finishing up an actual season and Auburn is playing Alabama that day, I would not a- expect much in the way of television at all to compete with that, obviously. Be on the Big Ten Network. Big Ten Network might be able to sell a couple of commercials to some of their old sponsors, and not much money, money at all from that. For a fan, would you be able to watch it on TV? I think it's possible. I think that's that, that's that's possibly um, very possible that that could happen. Let me go back here to. I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying that's what the calendar would suggest. If you finish the rest of the story problem, the story problem is Mel Tucker and his program have set out on a six and a half week off season program as if it's January after six and a half weeks of January, where would they normally be? They would be getting into uh, late February, early March and spring practice this year. That's going to coincide with getting into October, November. All right, MM Drippy Carter nine seventeen says, "Hey, Comp, do you think we have a great shot at Justin Martin?" MM Drippy says, "Tell us about Justin Martin's game if you've watched some film of him." Justin Martin is the quarterback from California. Justin Finn had the story about him, and there is some legit interest there. I've not watched his film yet, so I can't. I don't have much to say about him just yet. M.M. Drippy, let's see. Big Will says, is Michigan State going to run a 3-4 defense or a 4-3? By all indications, it looks like a 4-3. They ran a 4-3. Scotty Hazleton ran a 4-3 at Kansas State last year. He's a 4-3 guy. Tucker's done both. He's not married either way. In fact, he'd like to be able to do both. Some of his defenses at Georgia have been able to do both. At Alabama, they were able to do both. So I think he would probably like to have... A lot of big, great players in there in the front seven and the flexibility to, to do both. But to begin with, Michigan State's been recruiting to a 4-3. I think Hazleton will work with that to begin with as a 4-3. MM Drippy says, hit the like button, everybody. Thanks for that. Hit the like button. We appreciate that. Noah Conley says, Ohio State has no gap between the SEC. Just saying. You're right. No gap between Ohio State and the rest of the SEC. You're right about that. Pertaining to, pertaining to my comment earlier in the addition when I said that there's a big gap between Southern football and Northern States football. Mr. Bowman says, hey, cop, Coach D made a point to have a great kicking game. Will Coach Tucker do the same, or is it like the other teams, an afterthought? I don't think it's ever an an afterthought. I think every coach would love to have a great kicking game. Michigan State rarely went for pump blocks, and in the kickoff return game, they did a lot of fair catching with the new rule. Um... Not really sure. Ross Ells is in charge of the of the 
special teams. He's a linebacker's coach. Brings a lot of energy. And reminds me of John L. Smith a little bit, personality-wise. I could play the audio. We interviewed him back in the spring. There was a, a teleconference with him. And he's a Western Mountain type of guy, too. I mean, he sounded like John L. Smith. He came in yelling at everybody, What's wrong with everybody? What are you doing? I liked John L. as a person a lot. thought he was great. I would have sent my son to coach or my son to play for John L. Smith. No, no problem. Thought he was a good guy. Um, but L's, I, you know, he said back in the spring that they would operate their special teams based on the strengths and weaknesses of the opponent, which makes sense. If they feel like they can go after it against some team and get a blocked punt, they would go after it. That's a little different than D'Antonio. They, D'Antonio, they stressed getting the ball back. If you're in fourth down, we're not going to jump offside. We're going to field the punt, not turn it over, and we're going to get. And we're not going to be susceptible to a punt fake. So Michigan State did a lot of punt safe, didn't go after the punt block, didn't necessarily set up for the return because if you set up for a return, you're making yourself susceptible to a punt fake because you have people turning and running to get back here to block. So they didn't set up for returns. They didn't go for blocks. They wanted the punt. They wanted the ball back. That was their philosophy. Served them well. The Rossell's philosophy, I think, will change from week to week. At least that's what he says. Look forward to watching it. Tyler Miller says, if Nebraska wants to have football, my brother and I had a discussion, think Nebraska should go back to the Big 12 and replace them with Iowa State. Nebraska, I've been, I've called them the deadweight Huskers over the years. Full disrespect on that. I loved the Nebraska teams back in the old days. Loved those teams. Tommy Frazier and those guys. I am hip. Rick Burns. Jarvis Redwine, Rozier, loved those teams. Um, you know, later on with Christian Peter and those guys, they went off the rails quite a bit and went renegade and won national championships doing it. But it got it got kind of dirty, ugly there at the end. But I used to like them better when they were a good team battling with Oklahoma, option versus option, then they go to Florida and lose a bowl game. But anyway... Um, you're talking Bill, Steve Owens and Billy Sims going way back in the old days, Oklahoma. I'm talking Nebraska, my man. I always rooted for Nebraska to beat Oklahoma for some reason. I'm glad Oklahoma existed, though. They were fun back in the wishbone days. Elvis Peacock and those guys. Anyway, no, I mean, Nebraska, I, I give them a hard time because they're dead weight Huskers now because they're never going to be. You know, Tom Osborne's not walking through that door. Although, if they're ever going to get it turned around, Scott Frost, this guy, has got a chance to do it. He, they've gotten off to a slow start so far, but a guy that went undefeated at Central Florida, I, you know, strong personality. When they played Ohio State last year, and they got in the I formation and ran a couple of quick-hitting fullback traps, that was awesome. They they drove a little bit, got down there, and maybe kicked a field goal or something. It worked for for a few minutes. And that crowd went crazy when they saw that. That was cool. Uh, but I got a lot of respect for that place. I love that stadium. I love that stadium in Lincoln. Underrated stadium. Not just the people, but just the, the structure of it, the way it sits in a city. I'm not big on stadiums in a city, per se, but it's an old classic type of stadium. Um. I like, you know, when I say I'm not big on city stadiums, I like stadiums that are on a, in a college campus, like Spartan Stadium, you know what I'm saying? Or Beaver Stadium. Although Beaver Stadium is kind of a hodgepodge put together, I still love, I like that. That's kind of in the middle of some cow pastures a little bit too, though. But the mountains are there, which are, which are nice. But I, I like the setting in Lincoln. I like it. And they're the deadweight Huskers, meaning that they're just going to take recruits from the Midwest and not going to give them any recruits back to other teams of the Big Ten because there are no players in, the, in Nebraska. Unlike Maryland and Rutgers, Maryland and Rutgers have some recruits that teams could go in and recruit and benefit from having those teams in the Big Ten. You're not going to get that from Nebraska. Uh, but still, great tradition and a lot of positives. Would I rather have Iowa State than Nebraska? No way. I mean, Iowa State, no, you know, no. No. I understand Iowa State is in the contiguous footprint but you've already got the Hawkeyes the Hawkeyes run the television sets in the state and I realize that the t television states the televisions as electoral votes are not as strong a consideration as they were 10 years ago when Delaney put together the Big Ten Network 
and had the vision of bringing in Maryland and 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 Rutgers to get the New Jersey television sets. Now everybody's cutting the cord, and you don't get the TV tax from every almost every citizen in the state the way it was set up when when Delaney had that idea. But it's not quite you know back then you didn't you didn't bring in University of Pittsburgh because you already had the Penn Penn State with the Pennsylvania television monthly five dollars a week or three dollars a week from Comcast or whoever was in Pennsylvania Iowa you already had the Iowa people you know the big big the network was already going to be on every television set in the state of Iowa whether you have Iowa State or not. Big Ten Network was already going to be on every television set in the state of Pennsylvania, theoretically, whether you had Pittsburgh or not, because you had Penn State. So you don't need Pittsburgh. You don't need Iowa State, because televisions, it was all about the television sets. So Iowa State, no. Maybe there's somebody else out there. I don't know who would be better. People have talked about Missouri, but I don't see anyone leaving the SEC. But Nebraska, I like, you know, Nebraska fits in the Big Ten in some ways. I don't want to leave them out. I mean, they could make, they could help the Big Ten West be solid at some point, but I'm not in the Desmond Howard kick him out of the Big Ten camp. Certainly not for Iowa State. That'd be no. You and your brother are wrong about that. But thanks for playing, Tyler. <clears throat> Just my opinion. I might be wrong, but in this case, I'm not wrong. I'm wrong a lot. I'll tell you a lot of times I might be wrong, but I'm not wrong about Iowa State. All right, Kenneth Roberts. Thanks again for ringing the bell for us. We might go a little shorter today. Well, we're we're already an hour and we're. Well, I've only got about 20 minutes left. Let's see. Let me get back to the mailbag here a little bit. All right, question number seven. I can't remember who posted this, but what is your projected starting five for Spartan basketball? And how would you guess the point guard minutes play out uh, the playing time by the time the Big Ten plays this coming season. By the way, Izzo this week said he was on an interview on 97 won the ticket out of Detroit. Actually, it might have been last Friday. He said he's 100% sure they're going to play basketball somehow, some way this year. He says maybe I'm an optimist, but he fully expects to play. Starting five, you know, your starting five are going to be Rocket Watts, Aaron Henry, probably Joey Hauser and Marcus Bingham in the front court. And then the wing is either going to be Gabe Brown or Joshua Langford. Probably Gabe Brown. I think Joshua Langford will be happy to play and Michigan State might be happy to just to let him be the uh, old veteran coming off the bench, contributing when he can, keeping his pitch count low. Um, you know, Torbert and Chris Hill weren't necessarily injured late in their careers, but those guys came off the bench as seniors. I could see Izzo talking with Langford and saying it'd be better you know, for Gabe Brown to let Gabe Brown start. And uh, you'll still play a lot, whatever you can do. But I could see Langford, if he's healthy, I could see him being coming off the bench. Even if he's good enough to start, I could see him accepting that role. As far as Langford said, goes, Izzo's quote during the interview, he was, he was talking about Joshua Langford. And Izzo said, quote, knock on wood, but he is way ahead of where he was last year. We have taken it very gradual, but he has had no downturns. Last year, he would have had some good weeks, and then maybe a week he had to take off. He has steadily progressed. Quote, he says, If you know the kid at all, he's just an unbelievable kid, good student. If anybody deserves to play, it would be him. To what level, I don't know, but if he keeps going like it is, I think he's going to be a valuable part of our team, unquote. That's what Izzo said about Joshua Langford. So that's sounding good. A couple weeks ago here, I said that I'd heard that Langford was, um, Langford was uh, was doing was doing well, and Izzo certainly echoed it. I'm running out of juice here a little bit. Going to have to go on uh, the two minute offense here. Point guard minutes. Rocket Watts going to start at the point. I could see Rocket Watts also playing some minutes at the wing. Lawyer eight minutes at the point. Hogard, maybe eight minutes at the point or less. So if Rocket Watts plays 24 minutes at the point, maybe six minutes at the wing, I'm not sure if that all adds up to to uh, 40 or not, but something like that. All right, moving on here. Let's see what we got here. So this is Paul, who's currently residing in Howell, Michigan. He says, what percentage of time do you expect to see Malik Hall and Joey Hauser 
playing side by side as Michigan State's two bigs this season. What percentage of time will Malik Hall play the three? Malik Hall will be playing some three, I think, especially if Lankford um, goes awry a little bit health-wise. Malik Hall can play defense on a three, and that's what you have to do in order to be a three on offense. I think offensively he's better as a four because he has more of a quickness advantage when he plays the four. When he plays the three, he'll lose that quick quickness advantage on offense which we saw happen with Miles Bridges when he moved to the three. He wasn't as quick against the guy guarding him. I think Hall's better as a, as a, an athletic stretch four. But Hall and Hauser, they're both athletic stretch four types of guys. I've not seen them enough play together to see whether one of those guys can guard an interior player. Can Hauser do it? I'd have to go back and watch some Marquette film from two years ago. If I have time, maybe I'll do that. Somebody's going to guard a low post guy. There's If... Not everybody in the Big Ten has low post guys. But if you're playing Illinois, I don't think you can play Hall and Hauser together with Coburn in there, for example. So I could see offensively that could give some opponents problems. Could Hauser play against a five, a run-of-the-mill five guy that is less of a five? Against teams that play, against teams that don't play as a true center, could they play together? Possibly. Um, that's something that they'll work on. That's something that they will look at. Bingham is the center, though, I would imagine. Like Konendike said last week, the job he did against Coburn on one occasion showed that he could survive in there a little bit in low post defense. He'll be bigger and stronger since last year, theoretically. Maybe he'll be better um, as a center, but he's got he still has a ways to go, in my opinion. Bingham, been waiting for him to make turn the corner. Sometimes those tall guys look like that and never quite get it turned. We'll see. Question number nine. Realtor Evan from Bloomfield Village says, after a year and a half or so with Mark with Mel Tucker, do you think we are better off with him versus Fickle? How does the administration feel about the hire after six months? Better with Tucker versus Fickle? They both have their positives. Both have their positives. Better off? Hard to say. With Fickle, the thing is is that he was going to want an out in his contract for Ohio State or Notre Dame. And Michigan State wasn't going to do that. That's what I've heard. So if Fickle would have come in and done well, and then Brian Kelly retires, now you got a problem. Michigan State was not interested in that kind of problem. And they, they kind of... Uh, he still had the offer. And then I'm not sure what happened with the language, the contract, that part of it, whether he came back and wanted to change it. I'm not exactly sure. Still may continue to look into that. It's not that important, but someday when the history books are written, that could be an inter interesting, important passage. Although when you look back at history, sometimes people have different viewpoints on what was going on. Anyway, I know with Tucker, Beekman likes him a lot. Beekman likes the energy he's bringing and the can-do ha attitude he has. Uh, never making an excuse type of guy. Energy. Um, getting things done. Working with the donors, which Beekman loves. So Beekman likes him. Sam Stanley, the president, he likes that Tucker did not buck the company line. He has to like that. In recent days, when other coaches went against their presidents or said things about the COVID decision, we can all um, guess where Sam Stan Stanley fits on that. He's an expert on those things. I am not. Tucker didn't buck the company line, didn't say much about it, except he wanted people to mask up. He's been part of those um, movements. So, you know, like I said, Fickle might have done well, but you would have run into a problem with him later on. Tucker, you know, like Izzo says and Beekman says, there's something about him that is kind of a Michigan State. He's got a Michigan State demeanor about him, you know, that blue collar, you know, steak salesman type of guy. And if it works, if he starts winning, I'll be really interested about the potential energy of the program with him doing all he does. Could be a could be a good formula. Got to win though, and it's not easy. So, could really build on each other if it starts to get going though. Gator and Novi Michigan says, which wide receiver do you see making the biggest impact once football resumes? Well, you got to look at Jalen Naylor. You got to look at Jaden Reed. Jaden Reed, the transfer from Western Michigan, a lot of talent. Teammates really like him. Jalen Naylor, if he stays healthy, you can see he can be a plus player. Question number 11. Sparty from Pauly's Island, South Carolina says, Hey, Jim, as I'm sure we are all missing Michigan State sports pre- and post-game rituals, 
when talking about pregame and postgame, what is your Comproni Power Index of East Lansing Bar Restaurants for game days? He says, Peanut Barrel, El Azteco, Dublin Square are some of my favorites. I was at El Azteco about a month ago. Wandered over there. Family. Got something to eat. It was sparse. That was just before the Harper's thing. Or was it right after the Harper's thing? I think it was right after. So I'm looking at my waiter. I'm like, I wonder if he was in Harper's a couple nights ago. Oh, well. Turned out okay. I had a good time. Upstairs there is good. It's it's LS. It's nice. That dip is good, right? That cheese dip, solid. Topopo salad, it's a winner. Burrito plate, can't beat it. Anyway, you know, you're asking me about pregame, postgame bars. That's something back in the old days, back in the late 80s, I'd partake in. Back in the old dual, I'd season tickets at Dooley's. Um, but these days, man, you know, pregame, I'm usually, I mean, pregame, I'm, you know, in recent years, I'm driving kids to piano lessons or to soccer games or this and that, and maybe going to tailgates. I'm, I'm going to tailgates if I have time. Some of you out there, maybe I've been at your tailgates. So I'm a tailgate guy. Don't have time to really go places. I know, you know, Beggar's Banquet pregame had some potential years ago. But pregame, I don't have time to go to bars. I'd like to maybe, but certainly not drinking before a game. Although maybe I should. It'd make me a better writer. Is that what Grantland Rice did? Was he doing shots of whiskey during the game? Probably. You know Hemingway was. So maybe I should try that. No. If I drank, I'd, you know, by the third quarter, I'd be nodding off. We don't need that. But post-game, I can't go to bars because I'm working. So I'm not the guy to ask on that one. But you've mentioned Peanut Barrel and Ellis Teco, Dublin Square. I know Hopcat's got something going on. The Fieldhouse got something going on. The night before the game, I had some of my wise guy friends in from Minneapolis before the Arizona State game, and we were over at, I think we were at the Fieldhouse. Is that what it's called? And we were there like, you know, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, got something to eat, just hanging out, having some refreshments, telling a few lies, you know how that goes. And then, you know, we're there like it's 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and then the students start coming in. And that was like, I felt like I was in National Geographic because I was just watching these people, and it was just, fascinating because I haven't been down there in a long time right I don't do that I'm not gonna be creeping around down there it was kind of cool on the night before the game you can kind of get away from you can kind of get away with it the night before a game and not look too much like creepy old guy too much because people they probably think well you're here in town for the game whatever you were here when we got here then then you just kind of leave but um saw a couple former Spartan football players and they were having a good time it was good to see them they were very polite I'm not gonna say who they were because that's not cool but it's good to see them and they were like 24. They were hanging out with us for a second. That was that was good. Good people. And um, that was interesting, though. Felt like National Geographic. Anyway, you guys would know more about pregame, postgame bars than I would. Matt in Grand Rapids says, Do you expect the MSU parents to join others from around the conference in petitioning the Big Ten to play? Maybe. Maybe. I know that those petitions have gone out. Ohio State, Michigan, Nebraska, a few others. Um, but those schools, I think, have had a, had a big push from the football coach. Not maybe not publicly, but maybe behind the scenes. At Michigan State, I don't think Tucker's going to do that. I think Stanley's on the other side of it, and Tucker's going to toe the, the company line there. That's my guess on that one. Back to the questions. MM Drippy out of Traverse City says Casey Mize is getting called up Wednesday. Are you going to watch it, Comp? Yes, I will. Casey Mize, was number one draft choice, was he out of Auburn? Um, yeah, Tigers, I've been watching the Tigers, been enjoying it. It's just, you know, what they've lost four in a row, now they're nine and ten. But there for a couple of weeks, I was explaining this to my son, got a feel for what it's like for baseball to be important every single night. Every night you know who's pitching. Every night you know who they're playing. That's a great thing. I like a lot of sports. Baseball, the everyday aspect of it. Um, gives more to its fans than a football. I'm a football fan too, but football you only get to eat twice, you know, 12 times a year. 13 if there's a bowl game. You spend most of the time doing this, talking about it, waiting for it. And that's okay too. Talking season's fun. 
Baseball delivers game every single day. And if you're a baseball fan, it's just hard to compete with that. Qual- quantity over quality. But if you mix in quality also, when you get to some of those games that really mean a ton, I'm not going to talk about it too much. You don't want to hear about that. Green, go green, MSU 03 says. I didn't know his condition was that serious. Very glad he pulled through talking about Michigan State University. Amy Garland, actually it's Tyrone Garland, says, Evening Comp, Ty Garland checking in from Oak Park, Illinois. Good to have Ty Garland in attendance. Sam Witzke says, How realistic possible is a spring football season? Chance it actually happens. Great question. You know, the, the coaches and players are talking about it like, well, that's what we're, we've been assigned to do. We're going to go after it. But there are indications that the Big Ten people have not really given it a lot of thought before all of a sudden saying we're going to change everything to the spring. Binkman said that the schedule can be moved to the spring. The schedule they introduced last week, week and a half ago, can be moved to the spring. I don't know. The chances of it, gosh, I wonder if the chances are better if the SEC season ends then the Big Ten can start in the spring and say yep this is what we're doing all along this is the right thing to do but like I said earlier in the, in, in this edition I said the Big Ten usually does not operate in caring at all what happened with the with the SEC they just do their own thing but if the SEC and the ACC do play and finish their season and they have a college football playoff can the Big Ten really trot out a spring season and if they do that the NFL is not going to change their when the draft is they won't change when the Combine is, if they do that, um, if the if they still have the draft at the same time, then Justin Fields, he's not going to play in the spring. All these guys that are going to get drafted, they're not going to play in the spring. Maybe they'll play a couple of weeks and then opt out, maybe. So you're, you're going to have Big Ten teams playing a meaningless season in comparison to what the SEC did in the fall with fewer of their players a whole season to give you a negative accordion, accordion effect in the fall? I don't see how. You know, if you play a 10-game season, how soon do you have to finish before so you can have the recovery time in the fall? I use the Michigan State versus Miami game as an example. And that's that's three games into the season. So it would be worse for Michigan State if they opened with Miami. It would be more of a pronounced problem if... Miami plays a 12-game season, has the regular offseason. Michigan State plays a season in the spring, then tries to come back and play them again on four months rest. That's not good. But if Michigan State doesn't have a season in the spring, and Miami does, and Michigan State's most recent game would have been the Wake Forest pinstripe bowl 20 months earlier, you talk about a player. Players sometimes have rust if they haven't played in a year and a half if they miss a season. Can you imagine 85 players all with rust? I don't know. But if if, if this imbalance starts, SEC and ACC, if they have a season in the Big Ten, whether they do or they don't, they're kind of screwed for at least a year. Have to be. So do they play a spring season, you're asking? Percentage chances. Right now they're talking like it, you know, Two weeks ago, I would have said, no, spring season, no, it's not going to happen. But now that they've cut the season for sure, and they immediately cut the season and said, we're going to play in the spring, um, I guess they would have to back that up. Would the ADs be in favor of it? Would Warren would have to try to see it through. It's, I, you know... The more we talk about it, I know you've all talked about it and thought about it, but it's a puzzle. It's a problem. I don't have an answer for you on that one. Brian Bemis says men's and women's golf will never lose funding due to a specific donor. Interesting insight on that one. And like I said, it's only a four hundred thousand dollar program. I mean, that's a, that's a cheap one, cheap sport to have. German Minha says, "Hey, cop, any recommendation on MSU football books?" Yeah, I go to Lynn Henning. Literally wrote the book on a lot of the history. The George Perlis Ride of a Lifetime 
is written by Vahi Gregorian, who didn't really cover the team. That it, it kind of shied away from some from a lot of the a lot of the controversies. It left a little bit to be desired. You know, the Spartans, Fred Stabley. I don't have the, I don't have the dust jacket on that one. Solid, straightforward history. I got to kick out of these some of these old ones. Biggie Munn and the multiple offense. They called it the multiple offense back then. Look at these dudes. I appreciate this. Old school. Personified. Look at those cars back there. I wonder where that was. Dan Devine's in that one, isn't he? Duffy Doherty's in that picture. Um, anyway, multiple offense. There's some X's and O's this that don't pertain to today's football much. And I've not read it in a while, but I can't remember getting much out of this, but it's good to have it, and maybe someday I'll look back at it. Duffy Doherty, this one is an autographed copy of the great from the great Duffy Doherty. It's a thin book with Dave Dials, if you remember Dave Dials from ABC. And it's this one happened to be signed by the great Duffy Doherty. I think I bought this at the Curious Bookshop on Grand River in East Lansing, so that's a bookshop that's still in existence. I recommend... You go into that book stop, bookstore sometime. I also bought this one at the Curious Bookstore in East Lansing on, on Grand River. The Duffy Doherty, there's some good stuff in here. Not a real thick book, but the end of every chapter ends with Duffy Doherty talking about something outrageous, and you're like, what? What are you kidding? What? Really? Really? And then at the end, you realize it was a joke. It's like when you're, 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 you've, you've been, you're gullible enough to believe a joke before you, and you, when you're not realizing it's a joke. And Doherty got me, like, at the end of every single chapter. I thought he was telling, like, this real story about him and, you know, uh, Red Blake and, you know, Woody Hayes and Daryl Royal, you know, and we were and ta telling some story about and then it ends up being a joke. Like an actual, like a knock-knock joke. Not a real knock-knock joke, but, like, just a really corny joke. So that, I mean, it's really loose and casual, but... The Doherty one, you should go through it. These other ones, I don't know. Lynn Henning, I don't know. I got to get that dot .com book together sometime. Really need to do it now. I'm busy with a lot of other things, though. You know, work and other stuff. Being a dad, you know how that is. Every day. It's, I like it. It's good. Got to wrap this thing up. What do we have here? Sam Witzke says, 2022 Antonio Gates Jr. will be announcing his commitment on October 10th. How big of a target is he for Coach Tucker and the staff? I understand pretty big. Michigan State's been going after him. It's interesting that he's ready to announce a commitment. That's I didn't see that one coming. Um, I got to look. I got to get my ear to the ground more on that one. I don't have a good read on which way that one's going. Corey might already, but I don't have, any, have a read on that one. Any word on Ms. Linsky? And Doris Fan says Ms. Ms. Linsky... Committed to Texas. Yes, he committed to Texas. And uh, I I said when it was, I don't remember Michigan State ever beating Texas for a recruit when it comes down to those two. I don't remember a recruit ever coming down to Michigan State in Texas. It's the first time I can ever remember a recruiting battle coming down to Michigan State in Texas. Beating Texas for a kid, unless it's like a local, like a Charles Rogers, TJ Duckett type of guy. I mean, Texas can really roll out the bells and whistles. And you're talking about a Florida kid, Austin or East Lansing. That's a tough one to win. I like East Lansing. I like Austin. It's just it's just two different things. If Texas decides they really, really want you. Um, Doors fan, I was told by a coach that Bingham's family didn't want to redshirt because they thought he'd be a one and done. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And he should have redshirted because he's a junior now and he just needed more time. But, I mean, a one and done. I don't doubt that they thought that. Gordon Tenona, Tucker seems like a great Christian man, just like Coach D. Well, probably right. Voice Crack says, anything on the Jersey Boys? Haven't heard yet about their visit this past weekend. Estime and Vandermark. Vandermark, his film, big rotund guy, big bruising type of guy. A couple of his film clips look like he got over his skis a little bit bending at the waist a little bit too much when he needs to bend it at the knees, but then other 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 clips, he doesn't have that problem. Big, thick-legged, brutish guy. Frame and rotund nature. Reminded me a little bit of like a Wisconsin offensive lineman. And I looked to see if Wisconsin offered him, and they haven't. They haven't recruited him, which surprised me. Because I'm like, that guy looks like a Wisconsin guy. I'll bet the Badgers have offered. Looked it up, and they haven't. 
Reminds me of a cross between like a Wisconsin offensive lineman and Dan France. Dan France was a serviceable offensive tackle. Um, Vandemark. Then there's that one clip where he's really covering ground pretty good in his pass set out to left tackle. There's another clip where he changes direction to get to a landmark, and I look around, and I'm like, man, that's quick for a big dude. And you look around, and the balloons are, like, waving around like it's a hurricane. I'm like, that that film is sped up. Sometimes it's sped up on purpose. Sometimes it just kind of happens in the in the processing. But a um, physical, brutish, mean guy, which is good. Michigan State can, needs to recruit well at offensive tackle, so Vandermark's important. All right, um... What are the other 2022 targets for college basketball? I'm about ready to uh, run out of juice here. We'll have to get to that at some other time. Do I think the NFL will happen? looks like it's going to happen. looks like the NFL is going to happen as of now. I think they're keeping some of those adults in their own personal bubble, and I think it's going to work. College kids, it's going to be tough. Anyway, appreciate everybody dropping by, being a part of Spartan Mag Live this week. Make sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Go to SpartanMag.com, become a magger, become a member. Love to have you over there. Appreciate all the support we get, all the thumbs up, all the uh, questions. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Spartan Mag Live. In the meantime, I'm going to try to get with Conan Dyke tomorrow for a VCast. I may take off for a couple days, go up in this part of the world just for a little bit, and I'll come back. And, uh, should be fun, but we'll see you next week on Spartan Mag Live. Thanks. Good night, everybody.